Warm welcome to all of the Africa Center alumni who've joined us today for this webinar entitled, How Does Expanding Access to Justice Matter for Security? My name is Dr. Katherine Lena Kelly, and I'm the Associate Dean and Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I'm pleased to be opening this webinar, which is the fourth in a quarterly series that we've been convening on rule of law in African security sectors. As an, intro, as an introduction, access to justice is identified as a core element of the rule of law. Knowing how different formal and informal aspects of the domestic justice system work, what their pros and cons are, and how to engage various mechanisms one can choose from as a citizen are significant contributors in and of themselves to citizen security. And so in this webinar, panelists will discuss legal empowerment approaches and offer examples from multiple countries that illustrate the ways that expanding citizens' access to justice through domestic courts, through alternative dispute resolution mechanisms can mitigate drivers of conflict and enhance the security sector's fulfillment of its duties to the people. We will look at these issues from a civilian and a military justice angle and consider the various roles that security sector actors, prosecutors, magistrates and judges, lawyers, paralegals, traditional authorities, and grassroots civil society organizations can play in expanding access to justice to achieve security. Our speakers will draw insight from both countries in conflict or emerging from conflict, as well as from countries that are in more preventative postures at this point. More information on the Africa Center's work on rule of law and security sector governance can be found on our website. Links to the website and more will be posted in the chat. On the website, all of this information is under the programs tab. And before we introduce further information about today's webinar and begin the discussion, let me turn it over to our director, Ms. Amanda Dory. Amanda, floor is yours. Good day. Bon dia, bonjour. Siku and Zuri, assalamu alaikum. I hope I have uh, reached everyone uh, to, to wish you a good day uh, here from the Africa Center on the campus of National Defense University in Washington, DC. We're delighted to be joined today by a terrific panel to discuss how expanding access to justice implicates security and vice versa. We have alumni from more than 50 countries who have registered for the program today and a number of participants I know will have a vibrant dialogue. To introduce myself, my name is Amanda Dory. I'm the relatively new director of the Africa Center having joined in late July of, of this year. And just to, to remind a little bit about the Africa Center for those few who aren't alumni, we're an organization that was chartered by the US Congress more than 20 years ago. And we are a think tank and research institution in addition to offering academic programs like the one we're engaging in today, focusing on African security issues and US partnership. Our vision is security for all Africans that's championed by effective institutions that are accountable to their citizens. Clearly today's program fits squarely within this vision and our methodology of dialogue, peer learning and catalyzing strategic solutions. Before I leave you, I would just mention, please do visit our website for the latest research offerings and publications. It's www.africacenter.org. Some of our recent publications include takeaways from Kenya's elections. We have another piece that's the evolution of militant Islamic violence over more than a decade um, based on statistical analysis that's very interesting in an infographic format. We have pieces on illegal logging, mapping disinformation, the recent Japan US forum, there, there's a lot there. So if you haven't visited recently, I encourage you to do so. And with that, let me turn it back over to Dr. Kat Kelly. Let me now introduce the panelists that we have today. They come from different parts of the African continent and are highly regarded experts on these issues. Um, first, we have with us Brigadier General and Professor Dan Kuali. He is Commandant of the Malawi National Defense College. Previously, he was Chief of Legal Services and Judge Advocate General uh, for the Malawi Defense Forces. He is also an extraordinary professor of international law and international relations at the University of Pretoria and visiting professor 
at Lund University. He's been a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He's been legal advisor in the UN mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo and was previously a fellow at the US Army War College where he and I met. Um, he is also the current chairperson of the Malawi National International Humanitarian Law Committee, among many other honors and uh, positions that he has held. We also have with us Dr. Martha Mutisi. She is an academic and a practitioner with more than 15 years of experience working at the intersection between peace, security, conflict resolution, governance, and development. Currently, she's a senior program officer in the Democracy and Inclusive Governance Program with the International Development Research Center in Nairobi, where her role is to support and undertake evidence-based research and political analysis that helps citizens and public authorities address the sources of violent conflict, insecurity, fragility, and poor governance, while acknowledging the imperative for a gender transformative approach to these issues. Previously, Dr. Mutisi worked with UN Women in Zimbabwe. Uh, she's been a senior researcher and manager at Accord, and she has a PhD in conflict analysis and resolution from George Mason University, where she was also a Fulbright scholar. And last, but certainly not least, we have with us Mr. Lurie Nkwesom, Esquire. Um, attorney Lurie Nkwesom is currently the team leader of the Access to Justice component, and he is deputy chief of party of the USAID Mali Justice Project implemented by DEXIS Consulting Group. Prior to joining the Mali, or the Mali Justice Project, he served as the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiatives Deputy Country Director for programs in the DRC, managing a multi-million dollar portfolio of eight projects on legal empowerment, amongst other things. He has previously also been ABA Roley, country director in Mali, advising the government on transitional justice issues and working with communities and civil society organizations to establish truth-seeking mechanisms and to contribute to reconciliation. He also formerly worked for the Carter Center on Access to Justice in Liberia, including uh, the role of traditional leaders in, in providing access to justice. He holds degrees in law, legal translation, and international relations. So with that, um, I'm pleased to welcome all three of our panelists who are on camera with us. Um, I'll just say a few opening words and then we'll turn to each of the panelists for their each will present for about 15 minutes on these issues. I'm particularly pleased to have this set of experts presenting today because they all exemplify different aspects of what expanding access to justice for citizens involves as a process. So Lurie is a lawyer and rule of law development practitioner who has done work on this in a variety of countries, Liberia, Congo, Mali, um, including work on how expanding access to justice can break the chains of hereditary slavery and address sexual and gender-based violence crimes after conflict. Martha uh, is a social scientist and a rule of, rule of law development practitioner who has strong transitional justice and alternative dispute resolution angles on these issues she has deep civil society and pan-African institutional experience on this. And General Kuali, also a professor, brings an illustrious career-long perspective from the military justice side of the house, in addition to a prolific publication record as a professor of law. So before I turn to each panelist, let me preface this by saying that a key concept underlying how security links up with access to justice is the concept of legal empowerment. So legal empowerment is a set of practices that civil society and state officials can pursue to ensure that all citizens have an understanding of and access to the law, whether we're talking about criminal law, civil law, administrative law. Legal empowerment is the process of awareness raising, building confidence, building capacity for citizens to make sure that they can exercise their rights with adequate knowledge of the pros and cons of different justice problem solving resources that are available to them. So these resources may be state courts, they might also be alternative forms of dispute resolution like mediation or non-state forms of cust customary justice. And so we're here today to discuss how legal empowerment is equally critical for security. Indeed, for citizen security, for conflict resolution and prevention, it's important for people to have the information and the resources that they need 
to choose the kind of dispute resolution and justice means that they pursue when they're facing a problem across a range of institutions that have different strengths and weaknesses within the justice system. So personally, in my past work, actually with Lurie at the American Bar Association, I helped support some legal empowerment programs funded by the US government in Central African Republic. And one key type of actor was the community paralegal, which I'm sure our speakers will talk more about. People who act as community paralegals are seeking to help others, especially the poor and the marginalized, make fully informed decisions about which, if any, means of justice they use to solve their everyday problems. And so community paralegals often come from the areas that they're serving, and so they can communicate in locally appropriate ways about the pros and cons of using state and non-state justice forums to solve problems. Um, while people usually have access to maybe customary or traditional mechanisms of justice by themselves or through their family networks, they don't always have equally effective means of learning about or engaging with the state courts. And so community paralegals are one tool that can instruct uh, people on this. They can even accompany their clients through different stages of a justice process in state courts or through other mediation processes. And so this can be a particularly effective aspect of expanding access to justice when those community paralegals are linked to partners who fund legal aid clinics or cover litigants court fees that are associated with using the justice system. So that was the case in Central African Republic where community paralegals were raising awareness about local court and other mediation options for people who were experiencing security threats, whether from land conflict or financial disputes or more violent crimes like murder and rape. Um, and so we've seen um, networks of legal aid clinics providing information about these different justice options, accompanying interested parties throughout justice processes. And we have also seen in that context, complementary initiatives to deploy mobile clinics to provinces where judicial infrastructure had been destroyed in the conflict and led even to the reopening of certain district courts um, to hold their first hearings that they've held in quite a few years in Central African Republic. So I'm sure there are other examples that um, Lurie, Dr. Martha, General Kuali will cover in their presentations, but wanted to put this concept of legal empowerment out there to sort of set the stage for what it is they are all about to share. With that, I think this is a perfect segue to our first speaker, uh, Attorney Lurie Kwesong. So Lori, I'll give you 15 minutes and um, could you speak to the following? Uh, you've done a lot of work to expand access to justice in a variety of countries that are recovering from conflict, including Liberia and Mali. So how have you found that security sector and civil society actors are involved in expanding access to justice there? And what concrete outcomes have these efforts to expand access to justice contributed to in terms of reducing conflict or providing security. As you address that in your 15 minutes, could you also just briefly make a remark on what ways security sector officials can contribute to fostering access to justice to advance security at home? We have a lot of security sector officials in the audience, so we want a little bit of a twist on this question um, and your take on that as well. Thank you so much, Kat. Thank you for the invitation to this important meeting. I salute my co-panelists, Marcia and Dan. I salute the director, as well as Caroline, who facilitated the logistics for this event. And of course, I salute all of the participants who found the time to join us. Thank you very much for the two questions. I think that in 15 minutes, I will attempt to share my experience with the audience in this webinar. What we should note, first of all, is that generally the actors of the security sector are usually in a complex and complicated relationship with their, in the relationship with those dealing with the legal system. In the context I worked in, in Liberia, DRC, and now Mali, these countries have certain elements in common. They are either post-conflict countries or they are countries with current conflicts. And that is the case for Mali and even DRC today. And so the actors 
who are on the first lines of human rights violations in these countries are usually actors of national security. It could be the gendarme, it can be soldiers from the military and also police officers in Liberia. The stories that have been told and presented of cases of huge violations of human rights that are committed by uh, by law enforcement that are supposed to protect the populations and the various combinations that can appear in Mali, the pill, are targeted by the military or the police because this ethnic group is considered to be the accomplices of the jihadists. So these violations of human rights leave traces, leave stigmas that mean that when the countries recover peace eventually, the actors that committed these human rights violations are stigmatized. There is a lack of trust that comes into play and it becomes difficult for these security actors to regain the confidence of the public. And that explains, among other things, why the public turns towards less controversial actors, closer actors who better understand their reality. And these actors are, among others, the uh, traditional authorities, the paralegals that Kat mentioned, the civil society organizations that understand the communities in which they are meant to work, because it should be said, whether it's in DRC or Liberia or Mali, these countries have a legal pluralism in place. There's a concomitance between these overlapping legal systems. There are systems that date back to colonialism. If for Mali, it's French colonialism and or Belgian in the case of the DRC. Liberia was not colonized, but the freed slaves who came to Liberia brought the American legal system of justice with them. And so these countries have these formal systems in place that were inherited from colonization. And then they also have local systems for conflict resolution, for securing the territories and the communities. And so there's these two overlapping systems. And sometimes there are shocks or uh, conflicts between the two systems. And over the last 15 years, I've tried to, we've, we've, we've worked to find systems for establishing consistency among these various systems, the traditional, local, and inherited systems, such that the local populations can be in a better situation. So conflict resolution happens through these local systems due to the lack of trust and confidence in the government's formal system. We have put in place several paralegal programs, for example, through which populations receive information on the law, the way that they can defend themselves or the ways or the recourses that they have through the formal or traditional systems or through the court systems. And so these paralegal programs offer local conflict resolution mechanisms. You mentioned mediation earlier, there's a great deal of mediation that happens at the community level, whether it's um, individually or at a community level. This really contributes greatly to establishing peace in these communities. In parallel to this, it should be noted that given the lack of trust that I mentioned earlier towards a formal system that is represented by the police, the gendarmerie, and so forth. Populations find ways to defend themselves locally the way and ways to secure their communities and territories. And this normally happens through self-defense 
groups that play an, a huge role in securing these communities. Often the self-defense groups have tribal ethnic connotations, and that's normal because Africa is very much based on these ethnicities. So these groups work within their territories to defend them and to defend against for a, 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 a armed groups such as jihadists, but also against their own governments. And so these populations trust these self-defense groups more than they do the gendarmerie or the national police. And this is normal, and I said this earlier, these official security actors often have a very bad image due to the uh, history of discrimination, human rights violations, and often being themselves the perpetrators of conflict. And so it is very important to mention the fact that the actors of informal justice, such as paralegals or the traditional authorities, that they play really a major role in expanding access to justice and, and security for the populations. But when we get into the post-conflict stage, and where in which the state is reconstructed, where reforms are put in place, the actors in both systems find ways to speak to one another, to become accustomed to one another, and to work together. We have cases in which paralegals transfer cases to police officers or gendarmes. We have cases in which the gendarmes or the police officers refer certain people to legal clinics for those who need mediation. There are several cases like this that are documented where the police, for example, with say uh, an affair or a, a case involving a marriage conflict is referred to either the, the paralegals, the, the traditional authorities or others. So these are local mechanisms that are not set forth in laws, but that happen at the community level and that actors put in place to facilitate their work and also to ensure that the populations receive the various ways of accessing justice within their community. So in cases where this dialogue is not possible, in the cases where the police, the gendarmerie, or the courts do not do their work well, we have noted that communities can position themselves against these actors. In Mali, for example, we have traditional forces, religious forces that, dis that discourage the population from dealing with the police, or the other formal sectors in many ethnic groups or families going to the police, going to the gendarmerie, going to the court constitutes really uh, a crime of some sort, a, an offense. It is an element that could push the community, community to ostracize this person who is taking the case of the family to the national authorities because for a, for a Malian, there are mechanisms that exist to be able to resolve problems internally. For example, there are the jeli or the... This is a powerful voice for resolving conflicts at the community level in Mali. They use the mechanism of shame. Through the mechanism of shame, you give the opportunity to the one that that committed the violation to apologize and to make amends. There's there another mechanism, a traditional mechanism to resolve conflicts where ethnic groups, different ethnic groups can, can talk to each other and tell one another truths. 
And so these are the mechanisms that have been mobilized to resolve conflicts. And if one or another individual leaves this context to go to the authorities, he is marginalized and ostracized. And so it's very important to emphasize these elements because these mechanisms are important to the community, given that the gendarmes, the police officers sometimes commit actions that delegitimize their actions among the populations. So in post-conflict contexts like Mali, Liberia, or DRC, it is important for actors of the justice system in, uh, in general, and in particular security actors, police officers in particular, to better understand the communities in which they have to work. And I've always said this, when you transfer a police officer to a village, a community, or a locality, and you don't train the police officer to understand the rules, the traditions that exist at the local level, you're really there, you are going towards catastrophe because these individuals will take actions that go against the rules and that really will change their dynamic of power. So this leads me to speak of community policing. I believe it is the mechanism that works the best uh, throughout my work. Community policing, the mechanisms of such have allowed us to improve, to whitewash, to clean the uh, the police, whether it's uh, security forces, the army, the police, the gendarmerie, we give them the tools that allow them to become accepted by the community and to work with the community. So community policing allows, uh, opens the way and allows the police, the gendarmerie to better communicate with the community. We have organized, organized reunions with the chief of police, with the population, and ex to explain their role, why they are there, etc. The patrols in the community allow the population to better understand the role of the police and to feel more secure. And this also has improved the understanding of the judicial system by citizens. This um, provokes the citizens to really be more accepting of this. Uh, Laurie, one minute, please, if you can summarize. All right, I will move on to the next question. For me, it's important, it was really important to speak of community policing. To me, that is the main point, the main link to increase uh, trust in the, from the people with the police. So I wanted to really emphasize that. In terms of the role of the security actors, security sector actors, I think that uh, these actors have a double function concerning justice. First off is to secure the territory. They must first secure the territory to allow justice to prevail, the work of justice to prevail. And so the H security agents participate, they participate um, in both informally and formally. That in, and I would, so I'm going to summarize this within a paradigm, a three forked paradigm. There's partnership and cooperation and prevention that are tools of prevention. The role of these security agents is to put into, is to secure the territory, which will allow justice to do its work. In Mali, we have large areas of the govern, of the territory that are not secured by the government. And this we know. The government, though, has an important essential role to play, though, in securing these areas. Um, agents of security can secure the territory. They must occupy the territory, first off, as I 
mentioned earlier, that fits within the preventive measures. And then also in terms of the justice system, it's important that all the actors, the police, the gendarmes, that they are well aware of the laws, that they follow the laws to know how to uh, valorize their work. They have to be better staffed. They have to be better financed and have better human resources as well. They need to know their work better. It's a big, big problem in our country and in Mali and others. We have a lot of police that are not well trained, not up to date, not well staffed. They don't have the financial or human resources to do their work. And so it is not surprising that the uh, criminal justice system has many problems because of the slack of resources. In terms of the partnerships, I think the partnerships is a is an important key. We we are in a repressive phase of justice currently that's exclusive. So we need to have partnerships between um, actors of security, other actors of the justice system. And the, and the traditional justice actors and the paralegals, because it's important for all of these actors to work together to, um, to have these partnerships. That is the key to the success of all actions that um, actors of the security sector will take. It's impossible to work isolated. And these partnerships with the community, uh, it, if, we want, if we want to avoid the proliferation of, of vigilantes, of self-defense groups, we must ensure that the police and the gendarmes communicate better in better ways with the communities in which they are working, that they are supposed to be serving. And so for me, those are the main points. I know I'm going to come back to them, but those are the most important points that I wanted to uh, uh, bring up. And so to summarize, I think that today, access to justice only can function with the uh, agents of the sec security sector but they must behave properly. They must understand their role in the law. And if not, if not, the entire system breaks down all the way up to the courts. Thank you so much, Luri, for having shared your observations, not only observations, but very informed and uh, observations and analyses in this domain. And I do believe that you spoke very well about the links, be the relations between uh, the uh, the paralegals, community paralegals, the uh, police, community police, to ensure that people have a chance to uh, work together, have within the system of judicial pluralism. I think uh, we can discuss this further in the question and answer session that will follow. Thank you. For the moment, let me turn now to the, uh, Dr. Martha. And Dr. Martha, I want to ask you the same thing, but you have different country expertise. Um, so could you um, give us a sense as well of how you have found that security sector and civil society actors are involved in expanding access to justice in order to attenuate conflict or prevent it? Um, and can you also briefly address this question of how you think security sector officials can best contribute to fostering access to justice to advance security at home? Thank you, Dr. Kelly, uh, and uh, greetings uh, to the director, uh, Amanda Dury. Uh, greetings to uh, my fellow uh, panelists, as well as uh, alumni and participants. So um, with regards to uh, your question, uh, Dr. Kelly, I, I think the starting point is to recognize that uh, access to justice remains one of the challenges uh, that uh, contributes to uh, insecurity in most parts of the world. I think uh, there was a study which was done by the OECD in 2016, which revealed that about 4 billion people in the world lack access to justice. Uh, 
uh, they don't have access to uh, formal uh, court systems. And in most cases, uh, such systems are inaccessible or expensive, or they emphasize uh, on uh, litigation, uh, which ultimately is costly. So uh, expanding access to justice therefore becomes one of the tools uh, of advancing peace and security, but also dealing with longstanding grievances that communities often face. So for, for me, and also based on experience and the evidence out there, expanding out of access to justice becomes a critical tool that can be employed in all societies, whether we're talking about countries that are going through conflict or those that are in post-conflict situations or those that are actually enjoying uh, peace. So I'll start with uh, uh, expanding access to justice in conflict countries where in most cases um, uh, uh, the mechanisms for justice would have been decimated or destroyed by the conflict situations. In uh, situations like South Sudan, for example, or Somalia, where the uh, 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 formal mechanisms uh, of justice uh, would have been affected by the protracted conflict, it therefore becomes imperative to innovate uh, and uh, to uh, explore avenues of providing the much needed justice, especially at the local level. Uh, so we have seen even uh, in terms of the strategies that are being employed by security actors, uh, by peacekeeping operations, uh, such as uh, the United Nations mission in South Sudan, uh, the African um, uh, Union mission in Somalia, which is now known as the African Transitional Mission in Somalia at least, they do recognize the centrality of local mechanisms of uh, justice uh, as, a, as a way of uh, making justice available to everyone. They do also recognize of, uh, the need to work with local actors such as the chiefs, customary leaders, traditional leaders. In the case of Somalia, for example, the clan uh, leaders become uh, a very important part of the equation in terms of expanding access to justice. Number one, why do they work with uh, such institutions? It is to address uh, the local grievances at the, uh, that are existing at the uh, grassroots level. But number two, I think it is also a strategy of ensuring that uh, uh, security actors uh, undertake uh, almost like a civil military uh, relations approach, which acknowledges the value um, of such mechanisms because they have uh, always existed even uh, during uh, pre-colonial times. So we've seen, um, for example, in Somalia, AMISOM works very closely with uh, clan leaders, with uh, security, uh, with uh, 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 local uh, justice actors. They've also uh, uh, designed what they call um, community justice promoters uh, pro program, where uh, women, youth are actually in incorporated uh, in the uh, uh, awareness raising uh, processes uh, to raise uh, awareness on uh, people's rights, women's rights, youth rights, among other things. Uh, we also see in, in post-conflict uh, societies uh, that um, the issue of uh, expanding access to justice still continues uh, to be relevant, especially in countries which are facing uh, returnees. So I'll speak about uh, Burundi, for example. One of the longstanding issues that Burundi has uh, often faced uh, in its uh, post-conflict reconstruction agenda is the reality that uh, there are uh, 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 people outside of the country, Burundians who are outside of the country who wish to return home. But uh, part of the impediments to their returning home effectively uh, is to do with uh, the land disputes that they often face. Often when they come back home, uh, they find that their land has been taken away um, and disputes arise as a result. But thankfully, I think uh, the United Nations system through the UNHCR, the United Nations uh, High Commission for Refugees and civil society organizations such as uh, ACCORD, as well as uh, national infrastructures uh, like the uh, National Commission on Lands and Other Properties, which is known as uh, CNTB in Burundi have recognized the need to really institutionalize access to justice at the local level, where these institutions uh, conduct what is called land mediation uh, between the returnees and the host communities. Uh, it is a way of uh, promoting reconciliation, but also 
it is a mechanism of attending to the concomitant socioeconomic needs that uh, returnees often face uh, in the face of uh, in, in the wake of uh, having been away uh, from their home country for a long time. So um, the the work of the CNTB, the UNHCR, in collaboration with uh, 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 institutions like Accord, as well as uh, uh, local institutions like the Mashingandai, uh, who are uh, local leaders uh, who are selected uh, by the communities uh, uh, because of their integrity, have actually, um, as, if, if, if I can say, um, pre prevented uh, conflict from happening through their land mediation uh, processes. So access to justice uh, in a way promotes uh, access to security in the, in, in, in the sense that it acts as a conflict prevention measure uh, in post-conflict countries, especially those that are dealing with refugees, returnees, uh, IDPs, among other things. Um, I would also say that uh, expanding access to justice is also in recognition of the need for uh, pluralistic methods of security, even in so-called countries that are at peace or that are enjoying relative uh, peace. So for example, in Kenya, for example, I think the whole institution of uh, community policing uh, and other infrastructures uh, such as uh, court users committees, uh, as well as uh, neighborhood watch uh, uh, committees and paralegals uh, as mentioned by my uh, fellow pa pa uh, panelist uh, Luri, they are existing to fill in a much a, a, a yearning gap that uh, um, is still there even in countries with stable institutions. Uh, the demand for justice is very high such that a uh, modern court system will, will, will not be able to service that demand on their own. So access to justice can be promoted by using these institutions which can act as an intermediary between the communities and uh, the state. And uh, in so doing, it actually helps to improve state society relationships. In most community policing uh, initiatives, for example, or endeavors, you find that uh, there's now an institutionalized platform where security actors, the police, law enforcement, the uh, community members, community leaders, groups like women, youth, they meet regularly and discuss uh, emerging threats to uh, security, but also they co-curate solutions to those emerging threats. So it actually then ultimately ends up promoting a culture of dialogue, a culture of communication, but also a culture of joint strategizing. So in a way, expanding access to justice ultimately leads to uh, expanding security but also expands democratic participation in citizen engagement in the affairs of uh, uh, their lives. I would also say that uh, we have witnessed, even in countries like Kenya, uh, because of the institutionalization of uh, such mechanisms where there's regular communication between security actors and civil society organizations, there is a way that systems can act actually self-correct themselves in cases of uh, abuse of uh, power or excess, it, 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 excesses that are uh, sometimes committed by security actors. We saw that, for example, during the early days of COVID, where there was a knee-jerk reaction from security forces in terms of enforcing the COVID protocols. But because there were mechanisms such as uh, the uh, community policing uh, initiatives, there were mechanisms such as the steering committees on peace building uh, and uh, uh, conflict management. Those issues were immediately addressed in their bud before they became uh, the new normal. So in, in response, police were, were uh, very much able to take uh, feedback from civil society organizations in terms of how they could implement COVID protocol in a humane, in a uh, human rights based approach because there are institutions that exist like oversight bodies, uh, there are institutions that exist that allow systems to self-correct, to self-reflect, but also to immediately incorporate inputs from communities. So for me, uh, and based on also uh, analysis uh, from uh, uh, different countries in the region, access to justice is a tool 
that not only leads to the promotion of security, but it actually heals uh, and closes um, some of the fractures that we, we, we were being foretold by experts that COVID is likely to uh, lead to increasing divisions between the state and society. Uh, what then happened uh, because of the self-correction mechanism is that uh, the COVID pandemic became an, a, an opportunity to dialogue and to discuss in terms of how police can be able to work with local organizations, work with religious leaders, work with uh, women's leaders to enforce compliance uh, on the COVID protocols. Um, then, of course, I will also say that expanding access to justice is also um, um, important for security actors because it helps them to create accountable security uh, institutions. So when access to justice is uh, expanded, uh, when the needs uh, of communities are taken uh, into cognizance, whether it's their socioeconomic rights, their political rights, ultimately they are likely to also be able to, to be more empowered to deal with uh, some of the challenges uh, that they might be facing uh, with uh, security access. Um, in countries uh, with uh, limited access to formal justice system, we have, we have also found that uh, uh, people-centered justice processes have uh, been um, used to uh, actually respond to some of the, uh, um, the, the gaps uh, that uh, are identified. In Kenya, paralegals are, 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 are supported by organizations like Kituo Chashiaria, uh, the Katiba uh, Institute, and uh, they, uh, they play uh, a role at, at three levels, if I can say. First of all, they play a role in terms of raising awareness uh, on uh, people's rights, uh, uh, community uh, groups' rights, individual rights, but also they actually play an accompaniment. In some cases, paralegals actually accompany their clients to court, uh, to challenge unfair systems. But more importantly, what we have seen is that paralegals have an additional role of facilitating legal reform, for example, facilitating changes uh, in the cr criminal justice system. Then I would also want to look at uh, the case of Rwanda, where expanding Martha, access you, to justice. Sorry to elbow in. Can I, you have about two minutes. So if you could talk us through that and give us your final words, that would be great. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll just end with uh, the case study of Rwanda where the state has actually recognized that access to justice is a critical uh, aspect of sustaining peace in Rwanda. The peace that Rwanda has enjoyed historically comes from the recognition uh, that once there's no justice, uh, the, so, uh, uh, the peace that is likely to be created is likely to be not durable. So starting from the days of the Gachacha courts, I think the government in Rwanda has normalized uh, the idea of expanding access to justice. Gachacha courts were uh, 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 credited for dealing with uh, thousands and thousands of cases of uh, genocide which was committed in 1994. But beyond the Gachacha courts, because they concluded their hearings in 20, 2010, uh, the government of Rwanda enacted what they call the Abunzi law. Abunzi law recognizes that uh, justice can actually be provided by uh, people called Abunzi who are persons of integrity. They are community-based mediators who resolve uh, local disputes like land disputes, uh, boundary disputes, marital disputes, and in some cases also cases of sexual and gender-based violence. And what they have done is to help to bridge the divide between the modern court system and the grassroots approaches to justice. So I'll stop here and okay. continue the conversation. Great, thank you, Martha. These are all um, useful examples, um, adding to the variety of countries that we're hearing about and comparing here in the webinar, and excellent points about um, the linkages uh, between security and justice. You know, as Lori said, the law enforcement is somewhat of a window into the uh, formal justice system, or, or maybe even um, in, in the best case into referrals to other dispute resolution mechanisms that people have options for. And then you've really added to um, our comparisons and our analysis here by talking about um, you know, the need for pluralistic methods of security that go along with the legal pluralism that we see different countries having um, that are naturally different mechanisms there that one could avail oneself to um, to deal with security related challenges. 
or everyday problems that require mediation or dispute resolution. Um, I really liked your points about in, even in countries that are not emerging from conflict, um, there is an importance of having different mechanisms for access to justice to address um, refugees, IDPs, or returnees, for example, or even the Kenya COVID example, um, just in terms of having um, an anticipatory preventative response to key challenges that could have influences on security. Um, this grassroots access to justice component, community-based inputs into state institutions are an important part of that. And some of that comes from access to justice, grassroots models of access to justice that we've seen implemented in different parts of Africa. Um, so thank you for sharing those initial remarks. Let me turn to General Kuali now, and for your 15 minutes, and then we'll go straight into questions. Um, could you comment um, on how military courts and military justice systems relate to civilian ones in delivering peace and security to citizens? And how can security sector officials get involved in expanding access to justice through this kind of work. Um, this will give us a slightly different perspective from the first two, and I think it will round out for our audience um, the different ways that military and civilian um, justice might intertwine. Uh, thanks, Kat. I will respond to your question directly, but before that, uh, let me just uh, address the specific theme uh, of uh, this webinar uh, on uh, access to justice. Particularly, I wanted to highlight the importance of uh, uh, access to justice in terms of uh, provision of security. So number one, if we have uh, access to justice, it means we are curtailing the breakdown of law and order. People may not take the law into their own hands. And if we do that, that means we are achieving rule of law. If we respect rule of law, we deepen democracy. If we deepen democracy, we achieve peace and development. If we achieve peace and development, that will contribute to uh, the uh, achievement of uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, especially uh, goal number 16, which talks about peace and security. How do we do that? We do that by pro availability of courts. So stakeholders need to be uh, uh, they need to be able to access courts. Uh, they shouldn't be traveling long distances. They shouldn't be shopping for justice. We also need to improve uh, delivery of justice and more importantly, availability of uh, legal remedies. We also need to be able to enforce decisions of the court so that uh, those complainants are able to reap the fruits of their litigation, so to speak. And uh, also, we should not lose sight of effectiveness of punishment. So in the event that somebody has uh, infringed the law, they need to be punished effectively so that uh, justice is achieved. To address your specific question, uh, Kat, let, let me just uh, first highlight the difference between uh, military justice and uh, what is called uh, martial law, because there is usually a, a, a confusion. So military justice would uh, mean uh, the law relating to the armed forces. So you need to have a military court that makes people subject to uh, uh, the military court. So not each and every civilian would be subject to military law. Uh, so military law will involve, for example, the code relating to discipline for the armed forces, a law of armed conflict, uh, the standard operating procedures or SOPs in short, rules of engagement. So all that uh, framework, including operational law, uh, relate to um, uh, military law, uh, which uh, culminates into military justice. Whereas martial law is a law that, in, that is imposed when there is a breakdown of law and order or when there is what we call a statocracy. So statocracy is a situation where uh, the military uh, is uh, in control. So you've suspended the government, you suspended the constitution, and you've also suspended the courts. So you have a uh, stratocracy. Now, when it comes to military justice, the first thing that we need to understand is uh, a provision which is provided for in most constitutions of democratic countries. If you look at uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the African Chart of Human and People's Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, you find that uh, there is a principle that no one is above the law. 
And that principle also extends to the fact that no institution is above the law. So everyone, every institution is supposed to be subject to law. Uh, this is not uh, understood in most militaries. They think the military is above the law, but the principle is that no institution or no one is above the law. So we also need to understand the human rights imperative that each and every person has a right to access to courts for legal remedies. Now, most militaries do understand that uh, people are have access uh, or have the right to access courts. That's why we have a military justice systems. But what we do not understand is uh, that uh, the military justice system is supposed to be independent. So the difference between military justice system and uh, justice proper so-called or civilian justice is that uh, the military justice system has uh, a focus on military discipline, law and good order. So regimentalize it to ensure that uh, the armed forces uh, are disciplined and they also uh, comply with uh, good order uh, and military discipline. So whereas uh, justice per se will look at uh, fairness, will look at uh, you know justice, uh, so to speak. Now the other difference or the challenge that uh, we do usually have in military justice systems is that uh, commanders have that power. Uh, they, they think that they own the justice system uh, to the effect that uh, they may not provide you know, that facility or enjoyment of human rights. Uh, because uh, if you enjoy, if you seem to be enjoying human rights at the expense of military discipline, then that raises uh, a question uh, in terms of uh, military justice. However, if we understand that no institution is above the law, then it means even the military justice system is under or subject to uh, the constitution, which provides for strict four-way test for um, restricting or limiting human rights. So we need to understand that. The other difference between uh, military justice and uh, civilian or civil justice is that uh, most military justice systems are prosecutorial focused. So they tend to put much emphasis on the prosecution to the extent that not many militaries would have uh, departments for defense, for provision of defense to soldiers or officers. So that's another, another challenge. In Malawi, for example, we have noted that uh, challenge to the extent that uh, we work in hand in hand with the Malawi Law Society, and we're also about to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Legal Aid, so that uh, soldiers or officers who do not have confidence in our defense department within the military justice system are able to access or engage a lawyers of their choice uh, at uh, no expense at all, because Legal Aid in Malawi is uh, a government department. The other challenge uh, that I've seen is uh, dissemination. So you, we all know that uh, ignorance of the law is not defense uh, in the court of law. Now, how do you subject uh, a soldier who his job is to focus on uh, war fighting? How do you subject them to you know, the criminal court when they don't even understand the the, the uh, components or elements of a crime, the, uh, the actress reas uh, or the related, you know, men's rear. So you need to disseminate the law. You need to ensure that uh, soldiers under your command do understand uh, uh, the law. At least they need to have uh, a basic understanding of what, what the law is. Basically, we're talking about what to do and what not to do. Then uh, addressing your second question, uh, Kat, how do we expand a military justice system or how do we expand access to justice by troops? So number one is capacity. Capacity of uh, both the justice dispensing machinery, uh, the prosecution, the defense, as well as uh, what I just talked about, dissemination, show that the troops do understand 
uh, the law. So we need to enhance our knowledge uh, of, of the law within our setups. Um, this outside an example of Uganda, for example, where their courts martial have been very effective in reducing the backlog uh, in terms of prosecution of war crimes in Northern Uganda. So you, 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 I haven't heard, as far as I'm concerned, any soldier, any Ugandan soldier being referred to the International Criminal Court for prosecution uh, based on the crimes that, that were committed in Northern Uganda. Why? Because as we're aware, the International Criminal Court is not a court of first instance. They can only come in when a, when a country is unable or unwilling to prosecute their own. So the Uganda uh, People's Defense Force has been able to prosecute soldiers at that level. So capacity is key. But I also envy, or actually I admire the Nigerian uh, legal call. They have a very strong legal call. They are lawyers. Uh, most of them are my friends, you know, ranks of major general, uh, you know, in the uh, army, air force, uh, and uh, even the Nigerian Navy. The South African uh, legal call is also very strong. Uh, related to that is, I think, uh, most of our Francophone countries, uh, such as Burundi, uh, Burundi, Cameroon, they even have judges uh, within their military setup. And um, so that is uh, something that uh, we need to uh, copy in terms of our, our capacity. Uh, added to that uh, is uh, the issue of incentives. You know, we've had challenges whereby uh, you know, lawyers would go for uh, employers who have a deeper pocket. So not many, I mean, what I'm trying to say here is that the military may not be an attractive uh, destination for lawyers uh, or good lawyers, so to speak. So what we've done, for example, in Malawi is um, to advertise uh, widely uh, so that we recruit the best in the market, but also if you're a lawyer and you want to join the Malawi Defense Force, you start at the level of uh, captain. So you skip uh, second lieutenant as well as a uh, lieutenant. Zambia is also doing that. Uh, they've also recruited a good number of lawyers and they're trying as much as possible for them to specialize. In that way, you also enhance ch chances of uh, retention. We have also overcome uh, that challenge uh, I, in Malawi as well as Botswana. I've also seen them uh, adopting that through training, uh, that of specialization, but also promoting uh, paralegals. Because uh, if you have uh, trained paralegals within the military justice system uh, who are already soldiers, uh, if they upgrade to become lawyers, chances of uh, you uh, returning them are very high. So the idea of paralegals who may still be under the supervision of lawyers is also a good way of doing it. And added to that, I admire the system that uh, the uh, American uh, US judge core, especially the army has done. They've recently, I think, established uh, an army legal center at Fort McNair in Washington, DC, uh, where they are training you know, starting from court clerks, uh, investigators. So, I mean, in our countries, I think may need to, to do, uh, the, or they may need to get support uh, from the US government to build capacity uh, in the justice system uh, using this initiative. Now, uh, to close, uh, let me just uh, highlight on the way forward. I would like to emphasize, number one, the issue of training. Uh, training should be both ways, uh, Lawyers, as well as the beneficiaries of justice. As I've said, uh, ignorance of the law is no defense, so we shouldn't disadvantage the stakeholders by, uh, by uh, not uh, giving them exposure to the law. The second point is dissemination. Dissemination, they need to know the law well beforehand. They need to understand what the law uh, talks about. They need to know what they need to do, they need to know what they should not do. When you're talking about military justice, we should not uh, lose sight of uh, the law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law, because uh, international humanitarian law is a law that regulates uh, conflict. So most of the times when you talk about military justice, we're just talking about issues of day-to-day uh, -day discipline. But also you have in discipline when it comes to uh, combat, when it comes to uh, 
uh, oper military operations. So they need to understand you know, what is perfidy. They need to understand what are ruses of war. This can only happen uh, during peacetime. They need to understand the principle of dis uh, dis uh, distinction, for example. They need to understand what are, who is a civilian and who is a combatant. This, you cannot train them during wartime. They need to know during peacetime. Mm -hmm. uh, then the third issue is that of interpretation. You know, most of our soldiers, um, some may not understand, you know, French, some may not understand English, you know, very well because uh, they may have basic education. So you need to provide uh, interpretation uh, services for them to be, to, to be able to follow the procedure uh, when it comes to uh, trial. The fourth item of the recruitment, you need, uh, re recruitment is one thing, you may recruit uh, the best, but now for them to be retained, retention is critical. So you may need to provide incentives in order to retain the best uh, lawyers, uh, the best paralegals on the market. The fifth uh, recommendation would be uh, taking a proactive approach to work hand in hand with the civilian justice system. Most of the times outside, again, example of here in Malawi, we are regarded as an afterthought that uh, we are not regarded as uh, uh, members of the justice uh, system. But we should remember that the military justice system is part and parcel of the national uh, justice system. So we need to take a proactive approach to ensure that uh, the ministries of justice, the judiciary, uh, remind, remember us when uh, they are mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to training uh, initiatives. Mm -hmm. The other recommendation would be sharing best practices. So Malawi, uh, Kenya, uh, Tanzania, yes, uh, Mozambique, uh, Zambia, Botswana, they have uh, mutually they have uh, initiatives to share jurisprudence in terms of best practices. So for example, we are discussing with the Zambians so that uh, because uh, the, the Malawi armed forces or the military in Malawi is pretty small uh, relative to uh, the population here. So to the extent that uh, maybe the off you, myself, for example, I know almost each and every person in the officer corps. So it may be, it may be, it may be difficult to prosecute uh, you, you, your body, it may be difficult to prosecute people you know. So we want to enter into an arrangement whereby Zambian prosecutors can come to Malawi or Malawian uh, Defense Council may go to, uh, to Zambia. You know, we want to work uh, out uh, such, as, such kind of arrangement. But I may also need to add that uh, we have an initiative which we call the African Military Law, uh, Law Forum, which is an institution for sharing best practices uh, for lawyers, or not just for lawyers, but for any person who deals with uh, military law uh, on the African continent. So whether you are an American or British, but as far as you work with African militaries on issues relating to military justice, you are invited to uh, join this uh, very progressive association. Uh, right. Finally, uh, you need to empower the defense department within the military justice system. How do you do that? Because I'm saying this because, uh, like I said, we do have uh, a bias towards prosecution. So the commanders would support the prosecution and they may not be happy to see you defending somebody who they think is already uh, been proven guilty. But look, every person is supposed to be proven innocent it is supposed to be presumed innocent and to proven guilty, especially when it comes to uh, common law jurisdiction. I know that in civil law, it's the other way around. But then the point is we need to empower the defense department for them to be able to uh, build the trust and confidence of uh, the soldiers that we serve. Uh, mm -hmm. So they too need to have the same capacity and capability as the prosecution or even more. I thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward to discussions. Thank you so much, General Kuali. And you make really many interesting points, much like our other two panelists, but particularly um, your, your point about the importance of um, strong defense um, mechanisms, I guess, uh, within the justice system, whether that be military or civilian, maybe as a key element for helping to strengthen how those systems can be used 
to address what's coming up in some of the questions on the Zoom chat. Um, you know, when when security sector officials or some of them are part of the wrongdoing that happens or the justice that needs to be um, dealt with through the system um, in conflict settings or otherwise, you know, what does one do? How do all these systems work together? So there are a couple of questions on the Zoom chat that we'll go to now um, for the remainder of the moderated discussion. And again, please feel free to pose more questions in the chat and we'll have an hour long um, open discussion where people's videos and audio are enabled after we finish this moderated portion in this Q&A panel. So I encourage those who wanna further the discussion to stay for that if they would like. For now, let's do a round of questions. And I think there are four that I'll begin posing. And then I think we'll split up between the three panelists who answered what, so that we can get through as many as we can. Um, first, there's a question that's long been in the chat. I think, um, Lori, maybe you can take this one. It's about DRC. Uh, this person says, I am deployed on a peacekeeping mission in the DRC where justice is a far-fetched dream, more especially in the Eastern Congo. Most of the justice as we know it is compromised. What can be included in the justice architecture of states that are in conflict so as to ensure that people get the much needed justice they need, even if it involves the very same state security actors. Um, so Lurie, I'm wondering when we come around to you, if you could address this question. I wonder if you have anything to say about mobile courts from the work that Lurie and I have done together in the past um, at the American Bar Association. I know that was maybe part of the answer for Eastern DRC. Um, so um, that's question number one. Question number two is in French. So let me read it in French. Uh, la deuxième question. So the second question is linked to access to justice being a problem for indigenous persons and vulnerable people such as women. There's a lack in a lack of means of access to secure citizens and a difficult access or impossible access to justice. So there are examples of associations of jurists who of the training of paralegals to raise the consciousness of the community. So I am wondering if Martha and perhaps General Dan can answer this question. Lori and Martha actually what are the stakes for women and vulnerable populations in the justice field? What are the advantages and disadvantages and different justice forums and what can be done? There was a third question for Martha and General Dan. One second, I'm looking. Yes, in post-conflict countries such as DRC, CAR, and so forth, the United Nations often require integrating uh, the ex-rebels in the regular forces. So these former rebels become military officers and are exempt from being prosecuted. Do you not think that this practice is illegal and encourages impunity and uh, contributes to maintaining conflict? So for Dan and Martha, this question. And then finally, I'm coming back to English <laughs> for the next question. Um, there's, there's an observation from someone in Senegal that in Senegal, military officials and civilians are subject to the same jurisdictions legally. Um, so Dan Kowali, uh, what do you think about this model? And could you speak a bit more comparatively about the merit of that model versus others for ensuring that uh, the rule of law applies to all in um, a security context? We have so many more questions. So we'll try maybe if each person could be as brief as possible in addressing the questions that I've assigned them. Lori, we have the question on DRC um, and much desired but difficult to achieve access to justice. The question about women in marginalized populations and legal empowerment, um, what are their concerns in that domain? Um, Martha, we have the same question on women in marginalized populations, plus uh, the question about reintegration of 
um, uh, after after conflict. Um, and then General Kuali, we have the question about um, reintegration of uh, rebels after conflict um, and the legal implications, as well as the question about military and civilian jurisdiction. So Lurie, I'll go to you first. If you could take, I don't know, ideally three to four minutes at most. <laughs> Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Kat. Thank you so much, Kat. Donc, pour la première question, For the uh, first question, concernant, um, as regard or, or concerning en place, uh, afin de uh, what can be put in place to ensure justice for the population with the institutions, si even if justice, this includes the, the actors of the legal system and, of and the security and actors. Donc, je pense que je vais, je vais proposer trois solutions. I think I'll propose three solutions. La première, la première, the que, first euh, is, il est important, et d'ailleurs, Kat, tu l'as mentionné tout à l'heure, on peut mettre des audiences foraines. Les audiences foraines sont très important. importantes. Um, que, important. um, informal hearings are very important. They have two advantages. They bring about a closer relationship between the system of justice and those who are judged by it and enable the population to understand how legal systems and procedures procedures and, pros, and prosecutions work. It's true that they are very costly. Witnesses have bringing together all the different parties is very costly, which is why Many countries no longer include these in their laws, but when there's financing, this can be very fruitful. There's also the um, accountability of the, of the legal system and of the uh, military and police forces. There are unfortunately police forces that exist that are very repressive and, only, and so again you need to have this relationship between these uh, law enforcement forces and the population so we can ask that in uh, the police boards that you be sure to include a citizen representative who can make these police officers accountable the third solution I would recommend is technology. I think it's a shame today that technology is not more in use. In Mali, there are 20 million uh, inhabitants and more than 20 million have a telephone and they use it to buy things online and communicate. And it's a shame that this phone can't be used to promote access to justice. So in Mali, we launched one of the first technological platforms, mobile platforms, to facilitate access to justice by the population through a call or through a mobile app. So I think it's really crucial to use technology. And this comes back to the question on protecting uh, indigenous and vulnerable people, including women. I think today, and I thank the woman who asked the question, she proposed solutions as well. I think she's a member of the Association of Women Attorneys. So women and vulnerable populations need to know the law and find the ways to defend themselves when needed. And you need to create the means to enable them to have financial independence. Many of the crimes that women are victim are, are, victim of, are victims of are due to the fact that they are not financially independent uh, and, and are not educated. Women are very strong generally. So if you give them financial independence and education, just the basics even, just to know how to read and write, generally with these elements, women will be able to defend themselves. And then of course, technology, which is very, important and really makes the population, the members of the population independent with a telephone, the person can call, can ask for help. And women make up 
about 40% of the people who call our call center. And generally, people are very happy with the system. We are near 90% satisfaction with the system. For those using the mobile app and the call center, this shows that technology today is a viable, useful, indispensable, indispensable tool for access to justice. It's less costly and it's accessible. Thank you so much, Larry, um, for answers to this first round. Let's turn to Dr. Martha for three or four minutes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. So on the question on, on uh, what can be done to ensure that uh, traditional uh, mechanisms of uh, justice do not sub subvert the rights of uh, vulnerable populations like women and girls, I, th I think uh, there's a lot that can be done. One is to uh, ensure that uh, even though we recognize them, we support them, there's also need to uh, ensure that uh, uh, their platforms to continue interacting with them, strengthening their capacities, um, supporting them to, uh, to integrate gender considerations into their work. Uh, I think there they are initiatives that we can build upon uh, within the Great Lakes region, there's uh, the International Conference of the Great Lakes region, which is doing quite a lot of work with local mechanisms of justice, particularly training them on um, uh, sensitivities, gender sensitivity, human rights consideration, especially when, when they're dealing with uh, issues of sexual and gender-based violence. But more importantly, I think it's also important to, to uh, ensure that women are also represented uh, in these infrastructures. Uh, traditionally, in, in their organic nature, these uh, local systems of justice used to be exclusionary. But thankfully, because of uh, their institutionalization, um, in some cases by the state, we are also seeing calls for gender parity in uh, these mechanisms. So if you go to Rwanda, for example, uh, there's need for a 50-50 representation in the Abunzi committees, for example. If you go to Somalia also, where we are talking about the Justice Promoters Committee, there's also an emphasis on uh, gender, gendered representation. So having more women also play a role, not just as recipients of, of uh, the, the services, but also as uh, those uh, actors that can dispense the justice. I think it's very important. But also let's not underestimate the importance of uh, communities of practice in self-correcting, but also in ensuring that uh, issues of gender, human rights are in, uh, incorporated. So countries like Kenya, they have National Stakeholders Forum on um, uh, uh, alternative uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. So that allows them to look at their practice, to look at uh, uh, lessons learned, but also to borrow on uh, good practices and also improve on what is not working. On the question of uh, uh, whether integrating former rebels or for, uh, former armed groups into armies uh, in post-conflict uh, uh, societies, uh, whether it, it does not promote impunity. I think uh, in general, there, is, uh, there, there, there are sentiments that uh, there's no blanket amnesty. People must be accountable for uh, crimes that they have committed. So we're not just talking about integrating everyone. We are talking about integrating people who have no pending cases uh, of uh, human rights violations, uh, egregious violations against the population. If they do have such cases, then they should not necessarily qualify for uh, integration into existing armies. Uh, I think integration uh, in, 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 the, in the manner that it was designed uh, in uh, DDR processes was designed as a way of assuaging some of the existing uh, grievances in terms of representation uh, in armies, uh, uh, but it should not necessarily be devoid of uh, human rights considerations. It should really uh, uh, be in line with uh, the, the, the am amnesty uh, laws. Actually, in most peace agreements they, 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 that are being signed uh, in the continent nowadays uh, from 2000 and onwards, they disavow this notion of blanket amnesty. You have to be accountable for uh, any crimes that you committed uh, in the past uh, for you to be eligible for integration. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Martha. 
And uh, General Kuali, we'll give you um, the final word here. I may do one quick go around that's like 30 seconds each. Um, I'll give a preview of the question. <laughs> and then Dr. Kuali, General Kuali will come to you in a second. So I'll come back around after Dr. Kuali finishes. Um, we had a lot of other questions. I hope people will stick around for the opening open discussion. Uh, there was discussion of the tree of discussion, l'arbre à pas l'arbre. Um, there was a discussion of what are other strategies beyond community policing that state security officials can engage in to build trust. So I'm going to do a quick go around with our three panelists, something beyond community policing that you would recommend security sector officials consider um, given the importance of expanding access to justice. So we'll come around for that 30 seconds uh, limit on that. So just a brace. Uh, but first, let's hear from General Kuali for um, about three minutes here. Okay, but I, I had uh, outstanding questions which uh, I didn't address uh, from the first yes. round. I would like for you to do that first, and then I'll do the 30 second go around for each person after you finish see, addressing I the see, other I questions. I hear you. I, I'll be quick. Uh, just to carry on uh, uh, the question that uh, Martha responded to, I think it was also uh, extended to me. Correct. I mean, it's so the starting point is that uh, the Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols encourage a provision of uh, amnesty as wide as possible. And the result death of doing that is to ensure that uh, peace is achieved uh, as soon as possible. However, like Martha indicated, the law requires that uh, there shouldn't be a blanket amnesty, especially for those who have committed serious uh, crimes. Added to that, you also need to provide uh, reparations to the aggrieved uh, individuals uh, in as much as you punish those who committed uh, uh, serious uh, crimes. The United Nations uh, Stabilization Mission in, uh, in uh, the DRC has uh, developed uh, you know, good models for uh, reintegration. What is also key is uh, to address the conditions which first made those people to, to go to war. So you need to resolve uh, in as much as you do re reintegration, you also need to provide for resettlement and address the conditions uh, that uh, uh, caused peace, uh, the breakdown of peace in the first place. More importantly, you also need to monitor that uh, people are reintegrated and that uh, do not go back to their old ways. The other question that was posed is, uh, I think it was relating to military justice or civilians being uh, subject to military justice and vice versa. So number one, a, a soldier is a civilian first before they become a soldier. What that means is that uh, all military personnel are also subject to uh, the civil law or the civil jurisdiction, where civil shall mean a civilian jurisdiction. But uh, on top of that, they are also subject to the military court, which means that uh, the military are supposed to lead by example because they have a double, a, a double state kind of uh, uh, jurisdiction. I need to be clear here that uh, it does not mean that uh, civilians are sub subject to military law. They can only be subject to military law where they are involved in military justice. Say, for example, if uh, they, um, they lie under oath or they commit perjury in a, in a court martial, then at that point, they can uh, be subjected to uh, trial within the court martial system. I also need to clarify that uh, the military, in as much as they are subject to military law, but they are also can be prosecuted uh, in the civil courts, there are specific crimes, for example, treason, murder, uh, and uh, rape, they cannot be tried like in Malawi in the court martial. I think the case is the same with Botswana and Zambia. So these these, these offenses where they've been committed by soldiers, they have to be tried in civilian courts. There is also um, what we call a conflict of jurisdiction. Say, for example, you have uh, a military person who has committed an offense outside the barracks. Who prosecutes that, uh, that crime or that offense? So you look at the evidence. Where is the evidence? Where are the witness going to come from? And uh, like in Malawi, that 
that kind of dilemma is resolved by the attorney general. He assesses or he or she assesses where the evidence is and where the witnesses are coming from. I also need to respond to the question that was posed by uh, General Saenda in the chat. So he is talking about elitism, whereby uh, he is saying that uh, he's saying that uh, in most cases, the law or justice favors those who have a deeper pocket, the rich. Uh, this uh, is, is a concept which I call justice for sale. So it touches on uh, access to justice. The starting point is that uh, we need to understand that justice is blind. So you shouldn't look at race, you shouldn't look at creed, you shouldn't look at nationality of a person. So justice is blind. And this talks to uh, uh, access to justice and training of those who are dispensing justice. They need to understand. Government can come in to train the judges, to train the magistrates so that they're able to give justice independently. And it also talks about independence of the judiciary so that they are not corrupted, so that they, ju they dispense justice uh, in a fair manner. We also need to support or provide support to legal aid departments, which are able to provide, uh, uh, to provide legal services to those who are indigent, those who are poor. The law societies, Malawi, Zambia is doing that. They have uh, a program for offering pro bono services. So those uh, citizens who cannot afford the services of a lawyer, lawyers have that corporate social responsibility to provide a support to the indigent on pro bono basis. More importantly, we also need to empower citizens through political literacy. They need to understand their rights. They need to understand uh, how to defend themselves in court. They need to understand how to claim their rights. Uh, most constitutions of democratic countries have uh, the Human Rights Commission, for example, which uh, can also provide uh, legal remedies. The Office of the Ombudsman, which Kat and I uh, talk about quite often, which can also be uh, used uh, for that purpose. Uh, lastly, I think Anne Mwathai Mazen also posed a question in the chat whereby uh, she's talking about uh, eliminating competition between uh, security agencies. So key is uh, interoperability. Uh, security organs need to understand their roles under the constitutions or under the laws uh, within a country. They need to understand that they're not there to compete, but rather to cooperate. So each and every agency has their own roles, which they need to do very well. So interoperability is key. You need to have exercises whereby the police, the military can work together in their uh, various realms uh, in order to understand uh, how they can cooperate and not compete. Uh, thank you so much. Um, a lot of key points stand out here. Amongst them, I think one really interesting element coming back to takeaways for security sector officials um, it seems like, um, you know, this idea of security services being able to function as a referral mechanism to different parts of the justice system, whether that's happening through legal aid clinics or through the state courts or through other mediation mechanisms. Um, and so the idea there is in order to be good referral mechanisms and um, for those in civil society to mutually refer back to them, People in the security sector themselves need to know the law and they need to know the different aspects of the justice system so that they can pass on that knowledge to others who may come to them if the goal is to build up trust. And of course, there are different disparities in the costs and the benefits of using different types of justice that can be provided through the system, depending on who you are, whether you're a woman or a man, um, whether you are a PO or a, a, someone of another ethnicity. Um, it really depends on context, which identities are salient, but there are different costs and benefits for different people. And so it's a complex task, but one that requires, as our speakers have noted, a variety of different elements, formal and informal, within the security and justice systems um, to work together and for there to be more awareness and plugging in um, uh, to um, leverage the overlap that we see um, between how um, these different systems work and how these different sectors are working together. I think I will pass on our 30 second go round because we've already gone um, a couple minutes over. Um, but I hope that this is a nice summary of some of the key elements that all three of you, Dr. Martha, Attorney Lurie, and General Kowali, have brought up. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Thanks to all of you in the audience who come um, with a really nuanced vision um, of what some of the key issue areas are in this space. 